So before I get started, I, I want to give a few disclaimers. Uh, a couple of them. Uh, one is, why am I not dressed up today? Normally I dress up really nice uh, when, I, when I come and preach. Uh, one of the reasons is because I want this to feel uh, like youth group. So here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to get yourself back into youth mode, to teenage you mode. Now for some of you that may take a little bit more effort to remember uh, what that was like, and for some of you that may just be a few years ago. So get into youth mode. Mode. You may also notice uh, the chairs are different. If you were here last week, we warned you, but some of you may have not been here. And when you walked in, you may be like, what is going on with the chairs? The reason uh, I changed that is to mess with you. That really is the only reason. It was to get you to sit in different places. And it was honestly to get you uh, a little bit. We removed some chairs as well to sit uh, without having that space gap. Okay, you, Americans, we like to have that gap in between different groups of people, and they're still there, and it's okay if it's still there, but I see a few of us are being forced to sit directly next to another family. So I wanted to, uh, to make those two uh, things happen this morning. Uh, another disclaimer I'm going to give is there's going to be um, an abnormal amount of fecal references in this sermon. So if that offends you, uh, then I want to go ahead and apologize uh, for that. Um, so my name is Brent Davidson. I'm the youth pastor here. I'm also the children's uh, pastor here. And we have four seniors, as you all met. And so when I was thinking about doing this sermon uh, on Student Sunday, on Graduation Sunday, uh, what popped into my mind was like a commencement speech. Now, this isn't going to be exactly like a commencement speech, but I was at a few of the, uh, of the graduations yesterday, and there's a lot of talk about success. There's a lot of talk about what it means to be successful or trying to achieve success and, and those things aren't bad, and those speeches aren't bad, but I wanted to take uh, that thought and, 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 and gravitate it towards what does it mean to be biblically successful? What does the Bible say about being uh, successful? This is going to be a little different today because it is more like youth group. Uh, and so we're going to be using our voices. We're going to be using our, our pens. So if you don't have a pen, there's some in the front of you. If you don't have a paper, there's like little cards you can turn over in front of you and use those. Uh, but I want you to have that ready. Um, and one thing we do at youth group is, you know, it's a little bit more interactive. So it's going to be, I'm going to try to make this a little bit more interactive. First service did an okay job at that. I'm hoping y'all will be even more willing to, uh, to speak up when, when given the opportunity. So we're going to do a vocal exercise to start off with. Okay, we're going to do a two tongue twisters. I want you to repeat after me. We're going to, uh, Sally sells seashells by the seashore. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. See, it's not that hard. You can talk. Uh, the other one we're going to do five times on the count of, on the count of when I say go, we're going to do red leather, yellow leather, Five times. Ready? One, two, three. Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather. I've lost count. Yellow leather. Okay. But we get, we get the point, right? We're going to be using our voices. You need to be ready to speak up. It's okay. I know this is normal, normally a very formal setting. I'm trying to make this a little bit less formal. Uh, the next thing, I want to get your brain started and also make sure your pens work. I want you to write down, if you have a pen, I want you to write down this math equation. Last service, I got a lot of, uh that was the reaction I got. Uh, it's going to look really simple, though. It's write down 1 plus 1 times 0 equals. And then I want you to write down what you think the answer is. 1 plus 1 times 0 equals. I'm going to give you a few seconds. Write that down. Now, I want you to be bold. Even if you're wrong, I want you to be bold. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Um, who wrote down that the answer was 0? Okay. Who wrote down that the answer was 1? Who didn't write anything down because they don't like math? A few of us. Okay. Uh, the answer is actually one. And the reason it's one is because the order of math operations requires you to do the multiplication first. So you do one times zero, which is zero, plus one, which is one. So it looks simple, but honestly it's not. But our brains should be, uh, should be stirring now, should be uh, ready to go. So I need you to be ready to speak because I'm going to ask you a question right now, and I need to actually get a verbal response. Okay, so the question is this. Um, Tell me somebody, or just blurt out somebody that you think of when you think of the word success. Someone modern that you guys think of when you think of the word success or being successful. Who do you think of? Oprah. Oprah. Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Dave Ramsey. Who? Dave Ramsey. <laughs> Any, Donald Trump. Brent. Oh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> so we all we all think of people. When I was trying to. Um, I think of a person to use as an example. I was trying to think of somebody. I'm a sports 
fan. And, but I was trying to think of somebody that everybody would know uh, that was old enough where the oldest generation would know, but young enough where the young generation would know. And I picked Michael Jordan. I feel like we all know who Michael Jordan is. Even if you don't like sports, uh, you still know who Michael Jordan is. So what made Michael Jordan successful? Why do we consider him to be successful? Uh, one reason is because he was a champion. He won six rings, the, the most ever in the NBA. Uh, he actually had to have another finger to fit all the ring, or another hand to fit all the rings on. Uh, he's considered the GOAT. Uh, who here knows what the acronym GOAT means? I know some of us do, some of our teenagers do. So GOAT means the greatest of all time. He's considered to be one of the, if not the greatest of all time. And his stats, his points per game, all that would kind of attest to that. Uh, he's extremely wealthy. Uh, he was actually the first sports a person to become a billionaire. He is a billionaire right now. He's extremely wealthy. He's also extremely influential and powerful, partly because of his wealth and partly because of just how famous he is from being in sports. Uh, but if you go and you watch an NBA game and you look at the logo on about 90% of the people's shoes, they are all Jordan shoes. You go into inner city anywhere and you look at the clothing that people are wearing, it's a lot of Jordan attire. Jordan is very uh, influential in the United States uh, especially. These qualities are not inherently bad, okay? They're not inherently. God puts good Christian, Christ-following people in positions of power, authority, positions that provide financial security. God does that, and that is a good thing if we use it in the right way. So these qualities are not inherently bad. However, these qualities and, and, and that type of success is secondary uh, when we're talking about what true success is. We're going to get into what true success is. I'm not going to define it quite yet. So in order to define what true success is, we're going to be looking at uh, Ezekiel. So if you have a Bible, uh, you can go ahead and open those up. Um, I'm going to be using, it's going to be on the screen as well. So no worries there if you don't have one. Uh, and, and most of the time I'm going to be using the NLT or the New Living Translation uh, that form of the Bible when I am reading. Uh, you can already turn to Ezekiel chapter 2 if you want to do that. Uh, but we're going to be using Ezekiel as a case study in looking at what is success in the Bible. What does it mean to be successful according to the Bible? We're going to be looking at his calling that God given, gave him. We're going to be looking at the work that he had to do. And we're going to be looking at the results that came from that work. And we're going to ask ourselves, what is true success? success. So you should be at Ezekiel 2. Uh, a few uh, things before uh, we get started here, we're going to talk about Ezekiel's calling first, but I'm going to give you a background about Ezekiel's calling. Now, when I say calling, go ahead and equate that to command. Okay, I'm going to use those words interchangeably today. They're synonymous with one another. When God calls you to something, it's not like a suggestion. Okay, so if God calls you to go and to talk to a person about Jesus, it's not like, well, you can kind of do that if you want to. No, he is telling you, you need to go and do that. Now, whether or not you go and do it, that is up to you. But his calling is the same thing as his command. Those things are going to be the same thing here. Uh, a background uh, to the book of Ezekiel. This, um, five years before this book was written, before Ezekiel wrote this book, uh, the Babylonians had attacked Jerusalem. Uh, and Jerusalem was the, uh, was the capital of the southern kingdom. They had attacked, but they hadn't completely overthrown it yet. Uh, but they did uh, capture a, a large chunk of people from around that area, and they had sent them into exile. And among these exiles was Ezekiel. So uh, Jerusalem is still somewhat intact, uh, but Ezekiel has been taken away from his home and has been exiled into Babylon. And this is the people that he is primarily ministering to is the exiles in Babylon. In chapter one, we don't have time to read it all the way through, but I'll give you a kind of a summary. Uh, so in chapter one, uh, it, is, it is crazy. The book of Ezekiel is just crazy in general. I consider it to be kind of the revelation style book of the Old Testament. There's a lot of weird imagery and a lot of symbolism uh, that is used. But uh, Ezekiel gets a vision in chapter one. And the vision uh, is kind of like this. He sees what I'm going to call a heavenly flatbed trailer. So imagine a flatbed trailer, but instead of wheels, you have these crazy holy wheels, and you also have these kind of these weird creatures on all four corners of it, and on top of this flatbed trailer, you have a giant throne, and then you have uh, God sitting on that throne in human appearance. And he's not just like this friendly old looking, you know, human. He is this incredibly holy, divine, scary to an extent, uh, human representation 
of God. In my mind, it's Jesus. In my mind, it's Jesus. That, that, that you can argue back and forth on that, but when I think of it, I think of this holy pre-incarnate Jesus sitting on the throne. So Ezekiel sees this image, and um, like I think a lot of us would do, he freaks out. So he goes straight to the ground. Now, I think there's a couple of reasons why he freaks out. Uh, I think the first one is he realizes He's not really supposed to be here. Uh, this isn't supposed to be for him. Seeing the presence of God and the holiness of God was, was only the job of the high priest. So the high priest, once a year, would go into the holies of holies and, and would be in the very presence of God. And he had to have the right heart set. He had to do all this other stuff uh, that Scripture uh, tells him to do in order to, to be in that presence without dying. If he messed up or if he went in there in the wrong way or, he was, or the wrong person went in there, they would actually fall down flat and they would die. Uh, they, would, they would actually tie a, waist, a, 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 a rope around the waist of people going in there just in case they heard a thud. They could, they could reel them back out without going in because uh, then they would die as well. So he sees this and he knows, I'm not the high priest. This isn't the time of year. I haven't done all these things yet. Um, and yet I'm in the presence of God. Oh, no, uh, this, could be, this could be bad for me. So he's scared. I think he's also being humble. I think he realizes because of all that, uh, I don't deserve to even look at the image of God. I don't deserve to be able to stand in the presence of God. And so he humbles himself as well uh, onto the floor. And so he, as we start chapter two, he's going to be uh, on his knees on the floor. And you can see that as we go to chapter two. So we're going to read chapter two, uh, starting in verse one and ending in verse four. And it says this, stand up, son of man, said the voice. I want to speak with you. The spirit came into me as he spoke and he set me on my feet. I listened carefully to his words. Son of man, he said, I am sending you to the nation of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. They are stubborn and hard-hearted people, but I am sending you to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. That's Ezekiel 2, 1 and 2. So the, the, the calling that Ezekiel is specifically given to him is to proclaim the word of God and whatever God tells him to say, to proclaim that to the exiles, to proclaim that to the Jews that are exiled with him. And, and, and that message would also go forth and would be sent and, and received even in Jerusalem itself. And, and so the, the, the specific thing, he's going to be giving a warning to these people. And the warning goes like this, turn back to God or else, okay? And you may, that may sound harsh, but that's really the same thing message we receive uh, if we don't know Jesus yet is turn back to God or, you know, some things are going to happen you don't like. Hell is a very real place. Um, and so he's going to give this message, this, this warning that if you don't turn back to God, Jerusalem itself is going to be sieged and taken and captured and the people will be either killed or be scattered throughout the land. So this was not going to be an easy task, nor was it going to be a fun task. Uh, I don't know if you've tried to ever go talk, talk to people in general. It's not easy. I, you know, I, I'm not great at it. Just talking to people, that can be tough in and of itself. But going up to people and going, oh, yeah, you're a sinner. Uh, you need to turn back to God. That is especially difficult message. Now, there's a good way and bad way to handle that. We all know we don't want to be, uh, we're not called to condemn people, but we are called to let people know where they sit or where they stand with God. And one thing I really found interesting about this verse is you can, you can take this verse right here, this calling, and you can put this on us. We're given a very similar calling, each and every one here, if you know Jesus, that we're supposed to go out into a rebellious world and proclaim the name of Jesus. So you can already hear, you, this, is, this calling he's receiving is our calling that we have even now. So Ezekiel takes this job, he, he hears what God is saying, and he says, okay, this is going to be hard. The people I don't really know how they're going to respond to this, but you know what? I, I love you, God, and so I'm going to accept the calling that you have given me. So the next step for Ezekiel is he actually has to get to work. So he accepts the call, but that's not the end of it. Accepting the call, accepting where God sends you isn't the end of it. There actually has to be work done. Now, in a church setting, the word work, I think often we have a lot of... Um, apprehension about the word because we, we know we're not a, a works-based faith. We know we are saved by faith alone, but we also know that once we are saved, that faith or that works will come from our faith. 
So if, if someone says to you, and says this in James, that you, you have faith, but I have works, that doesn't work. But if someone comes to you and says, I have, it says the opposite of that, that doesn't work either. Basically, work comes from faith. It's always going to come from faith. It's always going to require work. Um, so here's another question. I want you all to, 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 to tell. You can raise your hand if you want to. You can just blurt it out. Here's a question I want you to answer. This is an interaction moment, okay? What is the hardest or the weirdest job you've ever been given? Think about it for a second. Anyone have a job? That, or maybe it's a job they didn't like very much. Yeah. Oh, see, that guy, that guy answers. What was it? Cleaning buses. Cleaning buses. What was over here? Hmm? Parenting. Parenting? <laughs> no, wait, which one is that? Oddest, hardest, or, 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 or the least likely you wanted to do? Yeah. Hardest. Okay, you wanted to be a parent. All right, good. Anybody else? Caregiving. Caregiving? That is a difficult one. Cleaning up after cows. That sounds like dirty, dirty work. Um, so my example that, that I thought of, it's kind of an odd thing. I was a janitor uh, back in Dallas for a long time at a church, and the church had a uh, kind of a, a daycare, Mother's Day Out program that took place, I think, three or five days a week, but it took place pretty often during the week. And so there's a lot of kids around, and kids, as we all know, are disgusting. <laughs> we know this for a fact. I I have a little one now that's three months old, and guess what? She's dis- I, I got to tell the story really quick. So I was at uh, Zach's graduation uh, in, in, at Randolph Southern, and I got a text from my wife. All it was was two pictures. The first picture was the, the doggy gate that was supposed to block the dogs from the bedrooms. I forgot to put it up. And then the next picture was our living room with diapers all over the floor that the dogs had gotten into and just spread everywhere. So dogs are disgusting too, but so... Our, our children. So I was working at this church as a janitor, and one of the oddest jobs I was given is something that I like to call toilet bobbing. Okay, now you may be wondering, what is toilet bobbing? Toilet bobbing is simply this: it's when you get a call, or uh, for me, they just come and maybe radio me on the radio and, and say, uh, "We need you to come here." I get in there, and they point at the toilet, and there, there's stuff in there, and a kid had put a toy in the toilet and then gone to the bathroom, and it wouldn't flush. And that happened multiple times. So I get a trash bag and I go bobbing uh, for toys in the toilet. So it was a pretty hard, disgusting, uh, often humiliating job. It taught me to be humble as well. Uh, But Ezekiel's job was actually much more difficult than that, much more difficult than I think most of our jobs here. Uh, It was equally, if not more, disgusting. uh, And it required a lot of trust and a lot of obedience to fulfill it. Uh, and so let's look at the jobs, uh, at least in this first part of Ezekiel, that he was given to do. And I warned you about the fecal references. They're all over this sermon, okay? So I've already had like three to this point. Uh, so he was actually given uh, multiple different live action parables to, to present to the people uh, that were around him. Now we know parables are, Jesus gave a lot of parables. Usually they were just, uh, he used words to do it. Uh, for this scenario, he gave Ezekiel almost little uh, little plays or skit kind of things to do, this live representations of these parables. The first one I put up there is to play with action figures. So what he was called to do was to take this clay tablet and, and draw a diagram of the city of Jerusalem on it. In my mind, just imagine like a diorama. He basically made a diorama of the city of Jerusalem. And then he had to pretend, I don't know what he used. I don't think they had Legos back then, but he, I don't know, he used sticks or something. But he had to pretend like, uh, like the Babylonians were, were sieging that town. So here he is playing with this little diorama, trying to show the people what the siege is going to be like if they don't turn back to God. So that's the first thing he has, is told to do. The next thing he's told to do is to tie himself up, and then he's going to be asked to lay on his side, each side, for a certain amount of time. Uh, each, uh, so he was on his left side for 390 days, and those days uh, were to represent each year that Israel had been living in sin, had been living apart uh, from God. And then he was going to go and switch to his right side for 40 days, and that represented the 40 years that Israel had been living in sin. So he was supposed to take the weight of their sin and literally put it upon his shoulder. Okay, so imagine that. He, he is taking that sin, and he is taking that burden and putting it upon his shoulder. So that's what that is supposed to represent. And now the next one up here, the controversial one. Eat poop bread. Okay. I thought eat, pray, love when I first read that and whatever. Um, 
So what does this mean? So uh, while he was laying on his side, he was still having to eat because we have to eat food as humans. Uh, and he was told to make this specific kind of bread. Now, whether he made it, he also was married, so maybe his wife made it for him. We don't know if he had to lay on his side for 24 hours a day or if it was just for a segment of the day. We don't know that for sure. Um, but we do know this bread had to be made. And this bread, this bread that was made was made out of all this kind of random assorted materials. It wasn't traditional bread. It was uh, a lot of just random ingredients were thrown together to make this bread. And then the bread was, was uh, put on a, on a fire that was cooked using poop, animal poop. Um, so what is that supposed to represent? Well, the, the random bread was supposed to represent the fact that it was going to be so desperate in Jerusalem for food, there's going to be such a great famine that people were going to have to just find whatever they could to eat. They weren't going to be able to choose what they wanted. They were going to have to, you know, just make it work, basically. Um, the, 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 the bread or the, 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 the fire with the, with the poop on it was supposed to represent uh, the fact that uh, there was going to be scarcity of materials or supplies. So normally you would, you know, use a, like a, an oil or something to, to light a fire. Well, they weren't going to have that anymore. So their main way to burn stuff was going to be so desperate. They were going to have to start using things like poop or other materials to, to start their fires. And the last thing it's supposed to represent is the, the defilement that was going to happen. So uh, Jews have certain eating regulations in the Old Testament, and, and some still follow that now, uh, that they're supposed to attest to. It's called eating kosher. Uh, that was no longer going to be an option for them once they were exiled. So once they were exiled, they were going to have to defile themselves with unclean food, and that was supposed to represent how that was going to happen. Uh, the last thing in, the, in, this, in this part of Ezekiel that he had to do, he had to cut off with a sword, uh, chop, cut, and scatter his hair. Okay, to burn, chop, and scatter his hair. So he was told to cut off with the sword, and he was going to weigh it out. He actually had a scale he was told to weigh it with, and he was supposed to make it into thirds. So one third here, one third here, one third here. The first third he was supposed to take, and he was supposed to burn it. And that was to represent all the deaths that were going to take place because of famine and plagues in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the fire represents pestilence uh, in, in that sense. So many people are going to die even before the siege reached its conclusion. Uh, the other third, the next third, was chopped by the sword, and that was supposed to represent all the people that were going to die uh, via the sword once the city was actually invaded. So people that were going to die from a violent death. And then the last third that he took, he, he scattered it in the wind, and that was supposed to represent uh, the, the, the remnant of people that were going to be scattered uh, throughout the area, including in Babylon. So those, these were all used to express to the people the consequences that would happen if they did not turn back to the Lord. So let's look at how Ezekiel did. Let's look at Ezekiel's uh, results. Um, who here... Had, who here graduated from, if you didn't do this, it's okay, okay, we're not, but who here graduated from high school? All right, anyone here graduated from college? Anyone here had their master's degree? Anyone, anyone here a doctor? Well, we have one in the back, that's very, yeah, good job, all right. Now, what I can tell you is, uh, when you're doing something like graduating, you're going to school, it's a lot of work, right? Um, and, and really, the, some, for some people, it's harder than others, but really, the harder it is, the better it feels when you graduate, like when you work really, really hard for something, when it finally comes to fruition and you finally see the fruits of your labor, it is awesome. And the harder you work, the more awesome uh, it feels. But what happens when you do all that work and there is no fruit? Does that mean you are a failure? So that's what we're going to be looking at right here is was Ezekiel a success or a failure? Uh, so we're going to read the next. Oops, I skipped twice there. We're going to be in 2 Kings. Don't worry about flipping there. You can just read along with me on the screen. This is 2 Kings 25, 1 and 2. So on January 15th, during the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon led his entire army against Jerusalem. They surrounded the city and built siege ramps against its walls. Jerusalem was kept under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah's reign. All right, I want you to answer this to me. Okay, it's a yes or no question, so get your mind ready. Did the people listen to Ezekiel? No, they did not. Because he warned them if they didn't turn back to God, this was going to happen, and this happened, so we know they did not turn back to God. So Ezekiel did all this crazy stuff that God called him to do, and in terms of earthly things, there was no visible fruit. So let's look at his, his scorecard here. Did he do good or did he do bad? 
So he was humiliated and ridiculed. We can imagine that. I mean, how humiliating is it to, to have to eat that food, to have to chop up your hair, to have to play with little toys, right? And we can imagine that people came and were very insulting to him when he was doing that. He was ignored. A lot of people just probably didn't listen to him and or rejected. If they did listen to him, they just kind of brushed him aside and said, well, we don't need to believe that. We don't need to follow what you're saying. Ultimately, he, he, he failed in, in what I think his, his goal would have been, which would have been to return the people to God. So he was unable to convince the Israelites to return to God. The one thing that he did well and the one thing that he was successful at was he was lovingly obedient to God. That was it. He had no other fruit to really show at this time, just his obedience to God. When I was reading this scorecard, I made this slide first, uh, someone popped into my head. And, th- and that person that popped in my head, it's the most church answer of all time, is who do you think popped in my head? Jesus, right? Jesus popped into my head. And so I made a scorecard for Jesus as well. And actually, in all honesty, Jesus, did, in a sense, did worse. Now, we know Jesus was successful. That sounds like I'm insulting Jesus. I'm not doing that. But if you just look at human stuff, uh, you look at his scorecard, it, it is, it is a, it's kind of difficult to look at. So we know Jesus was humiliated and ridiculed. Particularly, we see that on his uh, way to the cross or to the way to be crucified. Uh, people spit on him. Uh, they, they, they mocked him. They slapped him. Uh, he was ignored and or rejected. Some people just didn't pay attention to him at all. Others that did listen to his words rejected him. And in fact, when he was crucified, everybody rejected him. Nobody stayed around. Everybody left and scattered He was unable to convince the Israelites to accept him. He first and foremost went to the Jews. That was his first place to minister to, was to the Jews. And once they rejected him, then it went to the Gentiles. But first and foremost, it was to the Jews, and they rejected him. They didn't accept what he said. He was betrayed by a friend, one of his very close, one of the 12. He was betrayed by Judas. He was murdered. Uh, he was murdered because of the message that he brought. He brought this message of hope, of peace, of love, and of salvation to the people. And what he received in return was being crucified. So the only thing, when you look at Jesus' earthly life, the only thing that you can really point to and say that was successful was he lovingly obeyed the Father. So as we think about what is success... Um, I, I was trying to think of a verse that would sum this up for me. And there, there, is, uh, there is a good verse in, in, in Ezekiel, but it was like really long. It's like, well, I don't know. I want something that hits a little bit harder than that, hits a little bit more to home. And so the, it, well, the verse I'm going to use is actually in Luke. Uh, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. This is when uh, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is uh, praying for strength uh, to God because he knows he is about to be captured. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be uh, crucified. And, and, and this is what it says in, in 41. And Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So what is success? It's simple. And if you have a pen and paper, I want you to make sure you write this down. Okay. Success is lovingly obeying God, having a loving obedience to God. And I added that word loving in there because it's very important. If we obey God, but we do not love him, it's selfish. It's useless, and ultimately it will be fruitless. If we say we love God, but we choose to not obey, then we are liars, We are deceiving ourselves and we're deceiving those around us. James tells us once again that with love and with faith comes obedience and comes work. Uh, In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7, uh, it's it's mentioned, this is uh, Paul talking. It says, Apollos watered, uh, I or Apollos planted, I watered, but God gives the growth. And that's important because we've got to realize success is not results driven biblical success is not about how many people you lead to christ that's great if you lead people to christ it's not about uh how many uh worship songs you have memorized how many verses you have memorized in a worldly sense it's not about how much money you have it's not about the job that you have it's not a results 
driven thing. It is simply based on obedience. And if we are obedient, then God will choose to give the growth or God will choose to give the growth. That is not on you and that is not on me. That is not a burden that we are called to share. So I want to give you three things uh, plus an extra one to take home with you. I want to make sure you guys write all three of these down. So the first one is this. I am called. We've been talking about being sent. It's not back there anymore. I looked. I couldn't. <laughs> but it did say sent up there the past couple of weeks. But we are all called. Every single person here is called. Um, we are given a general call. So all of us are, are called to do uh, the things that are listed in Scripture, like obeying the fruits of the Spirit, having love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We're called to exhibit those. That is a call that we all have. We're all called to love God, and we're all called to love people and to exhibit those fruits to those people. So everyone here has a call. So don't say you don't have a call, okay? Everyone here has a call and has been commanded from God to, to, to fulfill that call. But we're also given specific calls. Uh, some people are called to specific jobs. Some people are called to ministries. Some people are called to their families and everything like that. So we are all given specific callings as well that we have to obey as well. So Ezekiel was not unique. The fact that he was called to do something, the fact that he was called to deliver a message was not unique. Uh, he was just like us. We are all given a calling to do. We're all called to bring the message of God to the people. But he does serve as a good example of what it looks like to accept. He, he serves as a good example of what it looks like to, even though it's hard, even though we're dealing with difficult people, to persevere and to follow through even in difficult times. The next one here is this. My callings require work. Okay? Work. We're going to be required to do work. We can't just... Uh, say we love God, but not go out and actually do the work that God calls us to do. Once again, it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be fun. Sometimes it is. When I'm doing youth ministry stuff, sometimes it is really fun. Going and, and, and bowling with the kids and doing all that, it's fun. There are other times it is not as fun. Uh, but regardless, if it's hard or if it's easy, I know it's going to require work, and it is up to me to decide whether or not I'm going to put in the effort required to do it well. And we are called to do it well. So my callings require work. And the last one is a little bit what we've already talked about. My success is not results driven. When I'm looking at my life, or I'm looking at the, the lives of the people around me, I cannot as assess my success based after what I have. I, I may be poor. I may not even have a job. I may be moving around from place to place. Uh, I may be struggling with things. But really what I'm called to do is to be obedient. So my success is solely dependent on my obedience, and that is it. So when we think of successful people, biblically, we should not be thinking of people that have necessarily have power and influence, but we should be thinking about people that listen to God and obey his word. My plus one here, this is to seniors, but this is also to everybody. This kind of sums it up, and that is this. God's commands, or his calling, God's commands are greater than my plans. Making plans is good. Who here is a planner? Anyone here like a big-time planner? Okay, I kind of am. I half hand up, right? All right? It's okay to plan. We're, we're, planning is a part of being a good steward uh, with our lives, with our time, with our money. Planning is a, a part of that. Um, but those plans should be secondary to what God calls us to do. So seniors, you may have it planned out. I'm going to go to this school. Uh, I'm going to get this degree. Uh, I'm going to get this job. And then, then my career is going to go this way. And that may be what happens. And that would be great. And maybe, God, maybe that is what God's called you to do. But we all have to be willing to say, I throw my plans aside if God calls me to something else. So maybe you're in school and you're doing a degree and God calls you to do a different degree. You have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm going to listen to you, God. Even if you're not a senior, maybe you're at a job right now and God's calling you to do something else. You know what you have to do? You have to start pursuing God's calling. You may be really, really busy all the time and God's calling you to volunteer or, or to, to help in some way in the community. You're going to have to rearrange your time and find a way to be obedient to God. God's commands are above my plans. And here's one that will really step on toes. You may be saving money for retirement. You may be planning budgetarily, which is all good stuff, but God still may call you to give in such a way that puts you in a more desperate state. And if he, call, he, if he calls you to that, it is your job, it is your requirement because we love him to obey. 
So God's commands are always put above our plans. I want everyone to bow their heads with me. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come back up here. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, that our success is not dependent on results, Lord. It's not dependent on, on, our, on our power, on our influence. It's not dependent on our own strength. It's not dependent on what we have, on anything. Lord, all it's dependent on is our obedience to you. That is what you have called us to do, Lord. I pray for our seniors here, Lord, that they take this message, Lord, and they um, reassess. Lord, they just pray and they ask God, are my plans your plans? And if they are, Lord, that's great. But if they're not, Lord, give them the courage to change their plans, to be in sync with your will. I pray that for each and every person here, Lord. We all have aspirations. We all have uh, goals in our lives, Lord, that we want to meet. But, Lord, if they do not uh, line up with your will, Lord, we need to cast them aside and decide, Lord, to pursue you and you alone. I pray this in your most holy name. Amen.